Okay, let's get started. The title of this webinar is uh, High Throughput Imaging and Sorting of Organoids and Spheroids. Uh, my name is Mikolai. I'm from Union Biometrica, and uh, we do uh, large particle flow cytometry to analyze and sort uh, uh, things that are larger than single cells, like model organisms, like organoids and spheroids. On this slide, uh, uh, I put three different pictures of uh, how the lab looks in 1960, in 2020, and how I wish it would look in the future. As you can see, the first two pictures are similar. There are some lab benches, and most importantly, there are people. I believe in the future, most of the experiments will be done by automation and in cloud labs and will not involve manual labor. And automation is key to get quality data for your experiments, to remove errors and to enable do more experiments and to test more ideas. So the goals are to collect data for every object in the experiment automatically, rapidly, analyze large quantities of samples, and set up screening experiments to eliminate tedious manual manipulation. So there are different ways how people produce cell clusters. One of the classical ways is to grow them inside scaffold matrix, like a matrigel inside petri dishes, and this is a great method because it removes the gravity forces on uh, cells and lets them grow in a three-dimensional space in all directions and develop the morphological features. However, it's not really high throughput because cells have to be laid into the battery gel and uh, they grow, some of them don't grow, some of them grow and uh, it's difficult to get reproducibility. The other one is spinner flasks. And this method is great because it allows you in a very confined environment to grow a lot of cell clusters. So it's a, a culturing vessel where you have a media and you put a lot of cells and you have some type of mixer and by adding different growth factors, cells start to aggregate together and form cell clusters. Um, it works for some cell types and for some cell clusters, but not for the other ones. For example, it works well where you have only one single type of cells that you want to make cell clusters into. Uh, another method that is uh, used more frequently now is a hanging drop method. And there are several companies that make uh, cell clusters um, and spheroids using this method so you could buy them. Uh, and it involves layering a single cell suspension or different cell type suspensions into the drop which hangs. And then cell naturally by gravity aggregate and form a spheroid. This is a great method to grow spheroids including those that contain several types of cells. However, it's not really a high throughput method because um, if, if, for example, in one of the drops spheroid didn't form, then that well cannot be used for any further analysis. Um, finally, the fourth method that is very often used nowadays is called micromolds. And uh, there are different products on the market, like micro cavity plates from Corning, or some of the molds made out of other scaffolding materials like agarose. And uh, it is great to, um, to generate large numbers of um, cell clusters. However, it doesn't completely eliminate uh, gravity forces. In this table, I put a summary of 
for all these four methods, um, whether they are good or bad for the automation, producing uniform cell clusters, and quality means physiological relevance. And as you can see, Matrigel is, uh, is great. You could grow really fancy 3D cell cultures, but it generates a lot of different sizes of uh, organoids, and it's not very easily automatable. Hanging drop method is, is, is great for uniformity and quality, but not very easily automatable. Spinner flasks, again, very economical solution. You could grow a lot of cell clusters in a confined uh, media, but in terms of physiological relevance, uh, it might not work. And then finally, the micromolds. So what do you do when you grow a lot of uh, cell clusters together and then you want to use them in your um, experiment, whether you're doing toxicology screening or drug discovery screening, or you just want all of them to look uniformly. One of the proposition is to use a flow cytometer. So our company is Union Diametrica. We make flow cytometers which could run things that are bigger than a single cell. And uh, this flow cytometers has been used by researchers for over 15 years now. And it, in, it involves a flow cell like a conventional fax. It involves lasers and detectors and uh, fluorescence uh, to detect fluorescence. It also does collect images of each uh, object is each cell, each cell cluster that goes by through the flow cell. After all the data is collected, it, it exits the flow cell and it's either blown to the side by the air jet or this air jet quickly switches off and lets the drop fall down and then the air jet quickly switches back on. So this creates this very unique uh, sorting mechanism where it naturally lets uh, cell clusters fall into the tube or into the multi-well plate. So it's very, very gentle for the cell clusters. And we make three different lines of instruments, a COPUS, a biosorter, and uh, a COPUS vision, and each of them have their own uh, advantages and disadvantages. COPUS is usually for a single lab or a single type of experiments. Biosorter is very, very flexible, allows you to change the size of the flow cell so that you could run single cells, C. elegans worms, Drosophila embryos, and cell clusters on a single instrument. And then finally, Copus Vision has the most sensitive optics and the imaging capability. This is the example from um, analyzing HT29 cell clusters. They were grown in corny microcavity plates. And you could see that uh, cell clusters out of those plates are very, very uniform. Over 42% over of them have very similar shape and size. So uh, this is a density plot, very commonly used in flow cytometry. And on a x-axis you have time of flight or size and the y-axis you have extinction or optical density. So if they have all very similar size and optical density and they all look like this, you can see that uh, this polygon gate R4 and uh, some representative images from a Copus vision sorter. Uh, these lines are of uh, optical density location and fluorescence localization within the cell cluster. What we could also see where, uh, which gate represents doubles. You could see those are doubles. And some of them don't, some of the wells in this microcavity plates, they have cells that don't really want to aggregate. So you have a much smaller cell clusters or single cells in there as well. So this allows you to really see what's inside of your sample. And this is a plate with assorted HT29 cell clusters. And uh, this, to sort this plate with a one cell cluster per well, it only took 67 seconds, so it's very fast. And uh, 
It was later imaged uh, with a bright field lens uh, illumination and uh, DAPI illumination. So each of the well has a cell cluster. So again, these cell clusters were generated in micro cavity plates. To compare it, uh, there is some data from spinner flasks. And uh, these are beta cell aggregates. Again, like I mentioned before, uh, this is probably the application where um, the spinner flasks would shine because you only have one uh, cell type. So iPS cells were differentiated into uh, beta cells and placed into the spinner flask and grown into these beta cell aggregates and further sorted onto a, a multiple plate for insulin secretion assay. As you can see on the same graph with the size and optical density, there is much wider spread of sizes and optical densities uh, within this sample. That indicates that the uniformity is lower uh, by using the spinner flasks and this type of sample. Uh, so each method has its own limitation. Finally, this is a classic. Uh, some tumor spheroids were grown uh, in um, matrigel, and then the matrigel was washed away, and then these tumor spheroids were analyzed and sorted using the COPUS vision. You can see on the top left, the uh, initial sample where you have a lot of different sizes and shapes of uh, tumor spheroids. Uh, the black dots uh, show that there are a lot of single cells. And this is the, the sample with which you need to deal. When we look at the uh, density plot with the size and the intensity of green fluorescence, uh, you could see there are different populations here. For example, R3 has mostly single tumor spheroids. Um, R5 has doubles or triples or quadruples. So something that didn't really form um, a, a spherical shape object. And uh, at the bottom, R4 and R5 has a lot of pieces of, uh, of matrigel and, uh, and single cells. So how do you do it? Matrigel under room temperature or 37 degrees is a, is a gel. It turns into liquid uh, on a, a, with a cold temperature. So you need to wash it away. Uh, and, and, and then put uh, organoids in the media and then load it on the flow cytometer. There is a very uh, unique method and approach that was developed by one of uh, our customers is using the encapsulated cell clusters in natrigel. And uh, there is a microfluidics device that very simply encapsulates um, cell clusters into these matrigel beads. This allows to save a lot on the, on the matrigel count because it's, it's a very costly material because it's derived from, uh, um, from biological sources. And then they were grown and then the whole beads with the clusters inside were loaded on the large particle flow cytometer. And it was able to determine where the empty beads were where the beads with the cells and cell clusters were. So it, it is a great approach for those cells which require matrigel scaffolding. Uh, and also you could save uh, money on the, on the matrigel cost. And these are some of the examples of the sorted cells from this lab. So these were MCF10A GFP cell clusters that were sorted. So what about the viability? Many of you probably think that uh, by putting uh, a very fragile cell clusters through the flow cytometer with a mixer, with a flow cell, with the sorting mechanism, it would destroy them and the viability would drop. Um, there is an example from this lab in Germany. Um, 
sorting the neurospheres. And uh, on the left, you could see the image of initial sample with, again, different sizes of uh, neurospheres and some single cells. And after the sorting, it was fairly pure with just uh, neurospheres of a certain size sorted. Uh, this sample was further analyzed for the viability uh, using cell titer blue assay. And uh, what was compared is uh, the blue bars on this graph is uh, sorted using large particle flow cytometer. And the uh, red one is uh, sorted manually with a pipetter. And you could see that over the 48 hour span, the viability didn't significantly change with uh, large particle flow cytometry over manual. That concludes that it, it doesn't destroy these neurospheres uh, in any way. So it's a, it's a great news. So what else is in the software except, except just counting and analyzing and sorting the, the cell clusters? Again, this is the view from, this, from the software. You could see your conventional um, density plots where you have uh, dots and gates, uh, like in conventional facts to gate the cell clusters or organoids or spheroids that you're working with. On the bottom, when you do sorting, you could see exactly which spheroid was sorted into each well. And the middle is the graphs that we call profiler graphs. And as the uh, um, spheroid go by, the detector in the flow cell, we collect actually several data points from each uh, object. And we recreate it into profile. And this could be a sourcing parameter. For example, counting how many peaks uh, are there, or shape of peaks, or intensity of peaks, or if there is a macrophages attached to the cell clusters labeled with the antibodies and with the FITC, uh, this could all uh, provide you with much more information than yes or no fluorescence or uh, more or less fluorescence. So it's a much more sophisticated uh, analysis and sorting tool than, than just yes or no. So in this example, is uh, um, a drawing of, of the workflow from the lab at uh, Shepens Eye Research Institute at MGH. And it's a uh, Michael Young and uh, Peter Baranov lab where they're trying, what they're trying to do is they will take IPS cells, different, grow and differentiate them for eight to 10 days. Then they would sort those uh, 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 retinal uh, uh, cell clusters and then they would differentiate them even more, they do enzymatic digestion, and then use them for transplantation to uh, potentially develop cellular therapies for diabetic macular edema, glaucoma, and other retinal disorders. And um, this allows, uh, this approach allows to pre-select only those uh, cell clusters which were differentiated uh, uh, with the glial markers that have a signal for the retinal cells. So this, on this graph, it's the same um, cell clusters just uh, fluorescent, with the fluorescence images. And you could see that the distribution of the fluorescence inside those cell clusters is not very uniform because uh, um, some cells would, would, would turn into the differentiation stage, some would not. And the goal to save uh, uh, on the cost and it greatly enrich the sample for your uh, cells of interest is to only take for further differentiation only, only those that have this high uh, fluorescence signal. And this was a thigh one uh, marker, which is a, a glial, uh, marker. Some companies already using our technologies, and this is example from the United Kingdom, where a company called Plasticell, they 
take on optimizing conditions for, um, for cell clusters and organoids. So they use uh, uh, this special approach with their split pool and they barcode each of the cell cluster and they test thousands and thousands of conditions uh, which uh, growth factor to be added for how long, uh, when the second one needs to be added. Then they use large particle flow cytometer to sort those um, cell clusters which differentiate it into a certain stage. And then they break them down into single cells and do TAC analysis and identify what was the condition that worked the best for this differentiation. Um, and again, this approach could also be applied for tax screening, drug screening. We also have uh, different automation tools that could go with our flow cytometer. Uh, by default, all our flow cytometers could sort into cubes or multiple plates, such as 96, 384, uh, to, could sort to petri dishes. However, you could also use it as an analysis tool. One example could be you bring your cell clusters in a tube, you set your plates with a flow cytometer, you add your drug, you incubate it, and then you use the flow set, uh, the LP sampler to sample them from the wells and send it back through the flow cytometer for reanalysis and potentially resorting back into the same plate. So those are all different options. Again, what we talked about is uh, different approaches for the uh, analysis and sorting of organoids and spheroid, spheroids. And I showed you some of the examples how our technology, large particle flow cytometry is used. To summarize, we have instruments, uh, we have three different instruments uh, a COPUS, a biosorter, and a COPUS vision. Each of them could have uh, different flow cell sizes. 250 usually used for the smallest uh, cell clusters, then 500 micron, and then one millimeter. Most of the research using cell clusters uh, using the 500 micron flow cell because once the uh, cell clusters start growing past 600 micron in diameter. Because they don't have circulation, the very center becomes hypoxic and, uh, and many cells turn into uh, apoptosis. Uh, you could have four or eight PMT channels to detect your f different fluorescence markers uh, between one and four lasers. And we do bright field imaging for everything that goes through the flow cell. And uh, we do real-time profiling of the objects for analysis and for the sorting. And uh, the objects could be sorted into different plates or tubes. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have other questions, please post them in the chat window. Uh, also, please come to our website, unionbio.com.